Who is the dog? Uh, the dog is a guy named Theodore Ned Ogilvy, and he started out as pretty much a normal fellow who uh, lived in Boston and was married and had a kid and ran a corporate security firm, and um, because of a personal tragedy, kind of went feral and um, dropped out of society. Uh, the, the name dog is self-inflicted. That's simply what he calls himself. Um, and he's now a trout bum. He's crisscrossing the country in an old RV. He's drinking vodka tang. He's smoking Swisher sweets, and he's trying to fish himself to death. And um, but instead, runs across bodies that uh, uh, require. Uh, he runs across murders, and uh, he, as a fly fisherman, turns out to be the person who can figure out what happened. Where did he run across his first body? Oh, he was fishing uh, Black Earth Creek, which is near Madison. In the middle of the day, uh, kind of a nothing much going on. He's fishing along, and he finds a guy floating face down in the pool in the creek. And um, turns out to be a local uh, activist, uh, environmental activist, and somebody's killed him. And so that's where that story starts. Where did you come up with the idea for the dog and the nail knot? Uh, the idea for the dog came uh, kind of in a roundabout way. I'd, I'd conceived of the series where you have a fly fisherman solving crimes, um, but I started out with a, gen with a gentleman fly fisherman, a guy who was, instead of completely untogether, a guy who was completely together. And um, it didn't really work that well, and I was kind of at odds. I didn't know what to do with the series. And then um, one day a friend and I were out fishing, and um, it was a sloppy, wet, cold day, and we met this old guy out on the stream um, who seemed to be, you know, full of character, really interesting guy. Um, and uh, was out by himself and appeared to be living in his truck. And uh, so we invited him to come back to our camp that day and join us for a beer. And he, he declined. He said, no, no, I don't touch the stuff. I can't, I don't, I don't drink beer, can't do that. He said, no. Uh, but we encouraged him to come by anyway. And, sort of forgot about it and uh, so this is a cold night we got a big fire we got two lawn chairs and we're sitting around uh, talking as we do and, and having a beer or two and uh, out of the gloom comes this this guy and um, we're not even really sure where he's come from um, because it's so dark but later on we realize he's you know pulled his his camper into the into the campground and staying there but uh, he says to us, I think I'll have that beer after all. And he sits down in a lawn chair, one of the two that we have, and so one of us stands and sort of paces around the fire, <laughs> and he starts to talk. And uh, one beer turns into another beer, turns into another beer, and it quickly becomes obvious why he can't have a beer. Um, it's because, uh, you know, a beer quickly becomes six. He started telling stories, and his stories were really interesting. His, um, you know, background and... Um, uh, so forth, but uh, after about the third beer, his stories begin to loop. We can begin to hear the same story over again. This is within a space of an hour or so. So, you know, something's kind of drastically wrong with this, and it turned out to be fascinating and sad. And we turned out in the end, kind of having to stand him up out of the lawn chair and turn him around and and send him off into the dark. And so, that's where I got the idea. That was a fascinating character to me, and it seemed to me like this fantasy of being a a, a trout bum and, and driving around doing nothing but fishing um, is real appealing in the abstract, but if that were really your life, um, there would be something wrong, something missing. Um, so that seemed to me like the kind of flawed character that might make a good um, amateur reluctant sleuth in a mystery. After the nail knot, Dog finds another body in Avalanche for the blood knot where where did the plot come from? Where where are you generating your ideas? Are you getting those while you're out fishing? Are you thinking about these things actively, or do they come to you in yeah. different ways? That's a tough question. I mean, I, I there's a there's sort of a black box that I have that I don't go inside, and and um, something's going on in there, and ideas come out of it, and I, I can't explain it. I don't really want to, but um, I, I think that I don't generally think about writing when I'm fishing. I think. Fishing is kind of like sleeping for me. That I'll go to sleep at night. I write early in the morning, and when I'm in the process of drafting, I'll go to sleep at night with a problem in mind, or if not a problem, at least a challenge, or knowing which scene is coming. Um, 
and I'll wake up ready to, ready to write it. And I think that fishing works the same way for me. It's really good for me to fish while I'm writing because there's all this subconscious processing that goes on. So um, exactly where the ideas come from and how they come together is kind of mysterious. But in the case of the blood knot, for example, um, I'm working with a, a, a location that I know really well. I'm working with characters that I, that I know. Um, in that case, um, the murder victim uh, is based on someone that I met who was a, a, a painter, uh, an old woman who liked to paint um, pictures of barns. And, uh, you know, I sort of transformed that into something slightly different, and, and she ended up as part of the story. So it's just a real big patchwork of conscious and unconscious stuff. When you finished The Blood Knot, the next book that you did was The Clinch Knot, and that takes place in Montana. Mm -hmm. Was it weird to write about something outside of Wisconsin, or was it time for the dog to just get in the RV and go, dog, go? Well, it was time for him to move. I mean, Wisconsin's a terrific place to fly fish, but no trout bum in his right mind would pass up Montana <laughs> or anywhere out west. So he clearly had to, had to get out of uh, Wisconsin, and so did I. So... Uh, it was different because I don't know Montana as well. Um, I don't even have to think about Wisconsin in terms of, t you know, the weather or the, the the landscape or the birds and trees and so forth. But you know, Montana, I had to actually spend um, a fair amount of time out there, sort of being receptive to that, being uh, doing research, learning about the geology and the geography and the birds and the trees and the animals and the insects and. So it was different. It was a challenge for me, and um, I, I certainly didn't feel as, uh, as totally comfortable in terms of, you know, my setting. So I worked harder to write that book than I did the other two, for sure. You are now the author of the fourth fly fishing mystery, The Wind Knot, and where does that take place, and how does that differ from the rest of the series? Uh, it takes place in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And there's a reason for that uh, involving Hemingway. One of the reasons that my character decided to go fishing in the first place is related to a, a, a famous uh, Hemingway story called Big Two-Hearted River. And that story, in that story, just to make it short, um, a young man who with a damaged psyche from, from war uh, goes off fishing by himself and essentially, in a way, heals himself comes to a moment where he decides that he is is going to, to take care of himself, essentially, and live uh, with the rest of us. And so <clears throat> that's sort of been Dog's guiding light all along, that he would go out and he would fish and he would heal and he'd come to a moment where he'd know that he was ready to, to turn away from loneliness and tragedy and be a part of society again. And so that all takes place, uh, the Hemingway story takes place in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So he's sort of been aiming to go check that out this whole time. So that's why he ends up in the Upper Peninsula. The book is different because um, I wrote it uh, stylistically different. The first three books are in the first person. They're inside the dog's uh, mind as a character. And this book is in the third person and it has multiple character viewpoints. So technically, stylistically, it's quite different. Um, and the reason I did that is because it's a different story. It's uh, not just a murder mystery. It, it is a suspense, or uh, I don't know the quite term for it, but it's a suspense or thriller at some point. So it, to me, I wanted to write a hybrid story where it starts with a death and a mystery, but it's not an old school uh, sleuth works his way through the clues toward the mystery. It, I wanted it to have more, um, more action and more momentum and uh, more suspense than that. So to do that required multiple viewpoints. It's, it's somewhat difficult to create a, a lot of suspense, I think, um, when you're just inside a first person character. It's easier to do that when you see other parts of the, of the picture. What are your plans for the future of the dog? I'm not sure. I'm, I, every time I finish one, uh, I kind of have a, a, a period of time where I uh, sort of deliberately have no idea what's next. He, we leave him off uh, on a small stream uh, in Pennsylvania. He's become very sick and uh, is uh, unconscious in the bunk of his cruiser. So who knows? Pennsylvania, by the way, is, a, is another fly fishing mecca, so there's a pretty good chance that um, he may recover 
and go on to fish the excuse me the, the Latorte and other um, storied uh, waters of Pennsylvania. <laughs>